clear the air a little bit first. Um, raise your hand if you think that journalists have exaggerated the dangers of AI at any point in time in the last few years. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have an interesting lead here at the end with no raised arm. Um, raise your hand if you think that, by and large, the benefits, if we get to steer this in a good way, the benefits as opposed to the dangers of AI in the next 10, 20 years are greater. The benefits are greater than the dangers. Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I knew we needed a skeptic. <laughs> um, it's important to have a devil's advocate. Um, all right, good. So on the theme of, of, the, of this AI festival, maybe, maybe we could just open the floor to you guys just uh, briefly and uh, you can say, you can comment on uh, anything that you've seen here or that you think hasn't been mentioned so far that uh, should be covered under this uh, this heading here. If I can just... Yeah. I think on what you've been asking, so I mean, I think we have to be clear that many things we are talking about and we are calling AI today are not AI, but just simple digital transformation or digitization. I mean, the fact that Amazon is selling books in the internet now, that your local bookstore uh, 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 goes bankrupt and, and closes down, has nothing to do with AI. I mean, in their recommendation system, there might be a little AI here or there, but that's digitization, so to speak. And, and, and the problem is that we, we, we've touched it in, in, in the QA session that, that even human intelligence is not very well defined. So what's about artificial intelligence? And just to give you a little bit of an idea, I mean, there is there are certain things that have to do with artificial intelligence, and this is language understanding, learning, being aware of the situation, uh, planning. Um, these are all aspects on if a system has some of these uh, uh, capacities, then you are maybe tempted to say they are using AI. But I mean, just to, uh, to make sure that they're just using some, some stupid machine learning algorithm for clustering customers, that's not AI. anyone disagree with that? <laughs> yeah, okay, so uh, can, can I summarize your comment then? So basically, I think I would agree with what you're saying if we can summarize it this way. There is a rather large gray area on which we can draw a line and say this side is not AI and that side is AI. <coughs> and uh, I, I think I speak for us all uh, when I say that there is a great variety in what people imagine and, and, and classify as AI and, and certainly think of as the future of AI, uh, for sure. And this confuses rather than helps uh, all and any discussion on the topic. And also it's become marketing jargon now to say that your company is doing oh, yes. AI just because they have a chatbot. Uh, exactly. I have yeah. a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> And you were smart in, in calling it intelligent machines because this artificial intelligence raises expectations at this point, right? I mean, intelligent machines, it's clear. I mean, the machines are there to extend our, our capabilities, right? I mean, we, we cannot search all the web pages of the world by hand. I mean, by using some smart catalogs, we need some technology that helps us doing web search like Google does. Uh, so this is a kind of AI we are using every day. We don't have much problems. And we also discussed over lunch. I mean, you ask it, you are, you, if you want to know something, you go to Google, you ask, is, is atomic power dangerous? And then you get some, some answers uh, or some, some web pages back. And then, of course, they are, they are ordered in an absolutely neutral uh, neutral way and then the most sensible way and then you go through ten or five or two of them and then you know the answer to this. Um, there is of course a political dimension to, to this, I mean, but, but, but not, not, uh, not, not in, the, in the future, this Frankenstein vision, but, but already today we are doing things, uh, we should be aware of what we are doing, right? Interacting with technology. Yeah. Machine learning, as you put it, is, is you know, I find that it's not real AI. Uh, could you mention some examples of real AI application in, in 
I mean, I didn't. Uh, so, so. Uh, you should repeat the question. I, the, yeah. the question was: I, I said, I said, a stupid machine learning is not AI. That's what I said. But of course, I mean, AI technology is used, or um, machine tech, machine learning is used within more uh, interesting AI system. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking web search or automatic translation with Google Translate. It's using deep learning now, and it has been a, a steep improvement in the last year. If you've tried Google Translate uh, early 2016, and from autumn 2016 on, I mean, it has been really improved a, a lot. I mean, using, so to speak, uh, machine learning on, but, uh, but, but the deep learning could, could, could squeeze much, much more out of the data. Uh, but I'm saying, I mean, so here we are dealing with, so to speak, with, with going in the direction of, of knowledge processing when you do translation, right? This could be one example where I would say it goes in the direction of artificial intelligence. As you say, it's a gray area. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I might inquire on uh, how the implication of AI, especially in uh, high-speed trading, possible dangers there. What is your opinion on the possible dangers with high-speed trading and implementing AI that companies do? Well, right now you can crash the entire world's stock exchanges simply by withdrawing high-frequency trading. Uh, when it stops, they're basically providing all the liquidity and so the prices just plummet. That's essentially what was behind the flash crash a couple of years ago. Um, actual AI in the... Um, dumb machine learning case isn't used a whole lot at the moment uh, because it's too dangerous. There's already been some spectacular blow-ups like Knight Capital where they lost four billion in basically half an hour. Um, and But that's the potential. I mean, the problem is, and it doesn't matter what you call it, um, all computers ever were were a force multiplier. So, you know, instead of needing you know, a whole army of people to do it, you give one person a computer and an in and the internet, and suddenly there are vistas open to this one person that never were before. And the problem is there's seven billion people on the planet, and you're now essentially at the mercy of any one of them that has a bad motive and a computer. And you just multiply that up, you know. I mean, Chris started this by sort of saying, well, you know, what does, you know, what, what about the predictions? Could it really be that bad? Well. Thanks to really bad machine learning algorithms, and Google and Facebook both essentially not giving you everybody the same data, but a, a reflected data of what they thought people wanted to read, we have the most well-armed superpower, the one with all the nuclear weapons, its entire government basically being uh, interfered with at best and challenged at worst by a foreign hostile power. Now, how does it get any worse than that, right? You know, our governments are being destabilized as we speak by actually well-meant, well but ultimately commercially driven, machine learning. And it's out of control as we speak. So, you know, how does it get worse if our governments are being destabilized, right? Can and that's just with done machine learning. I have a question regarding the it, it closed inside the knowledge bottle, but because Facebook, Google, and other s smart uh, companies, they, they push information towards you. Can, can artificial intelligence lead to reducing intelligence of humans? Will we be utterly stupid in maybe 20 years? Ignorant. So. I don't know, I, I don't see into the future. But if you think about, you know, back in the days where people were doing a lot of manual labor, I don't know, building something with their hands. And they think, they ask this question, do our machines going to make us incapable of working because we can't do real work? And then the answer is no. I mean, we just do other work. And I guess the same is for this question. Maybe there are things that we become ignorant about, but I guess we learn new things. And on that question, who are going to lose the jobs? Is it going to be the, the dumb people or the, or the other people? The ones that think they are smart. <laughs> <laughs> then why are you? Yeah. I mean, you don't need AI to take a, take a hold. You need a shop. Well, if, Actually, you, if you want a machine to, uh, that you press the button on uh, and it goes out in the yard and digs the right hole, then you need AI. 
<laughs> and that's the kind of uh, machines, that's uh, one kind of machine that I'd really like to have. You know, another machine is the one that builds uh, high rises and demolishes high rises. I think the, the losing job thing is, is being overblown, to be honest. I mean, the last time this happened was the 1920s. There was a mass relocation of people from the farms. I think we had something like 80 or 90% of people in agriculture at the beginning of the 20th century, and now it's under 1%. And nobody misses those jobs. I mean, in China, people will go and work in factories for 12 hours a day rather than be stuck out on farms, right? So. What I hope is that in the next 100 years, we basically take people out of the factories where they're also doing highly unpleasant work and give them work that's more interesting, you know, that uses human potential more, because a lot of the jobs we have don't. And that's the potential with machines, that we can get them to do the, the idiot stuff. Is it, is it then not also about finding, a, let's say, a balance between the intelligence of the machine and the dexterity of the machine? In what sense? In the sense that human hands, they are far more capable than, than many machines of doing fine, fine tasks. So I mean, it is a, it's a progress of continuous development. Yes. I think. Yeah. The, yeah, also, sorry. No, go ahead. I think, I mean, the, the machines, for example, they are not, not as creative as we are, but they can help creative people to be more productive, more creative, getting nicer information, faster communication. We don't, I mean, half of, of my time I sit there making appointments and, and cancelling appointments and sending emails, I mean, with bank account information and all these kinds. I'm, I'm my own secretary. 50, 50, I felt 50% 50 of my day I'm doing these things. I mean, and if these things would work smarter, then I could do other things, right? I mean, this is for sure. But also an interesting point is, as you say, uh, I, we talked this this over lunch. I think the the task of cleaning our bathroom, and I know, I mean, I do it every week. I mean, you have different detergents and different um, pieces of cloth, and you have a mirror, and you have a toilet, and you need to press harder here, and you don't need to press hard there. I mean, and all bathrooms are different. But when I go to to each of your bathroom, I know exactly what I need to do. But if you think of a robot, a general robot that could clean all our bathrooms in the right way, that would be very difficult to to build today, right? I mean, with machine learning. I mean, how 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 would you do that, right? But at the same time, I mean, some 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 clerk doing some repetitive, I mean, like scanning a document and filing it somewhere and and, and sending out the request to send another document and these kinds of things, they are they are, they can be automated even with the stupid, I mean, with the stupid, so to speak. Uh, um, uh, declarative uh, uh, algorithm, if you want so. So, I mean, the, and, and, and before you, the machines will work on, on, on a construction site, I mean, lifting uh, heavy things and waiting until the lorry truck comes and, I mean, digging in the dirt. I see, I see, I mean, as you say, I mean, I see some, some jobs with the white uh, and blue colors uh, are maybe more in danger uh, than, 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 than this heavy manual work. I mean, so there, there might be also some, some misconception. Uh, so at least we'll have bathroom cleaning left. <laughs> <laughs> to me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, there are two things I wanted to throw in here that I think are, are affecting this, this kind of, the, the, uh, the dialogue on this topic quite a bit. Um, and that one, one of those is the, the fact that human beings are general learners. And this is very different from all of the AI techniques developed so far. Um, no one has actually proposed a, a, how you could build a general learner. So we must not forget that. Uh, so that means people can go back to school. Uh, the other is that uh, in the, in the uh, earlier, uh, er, especially early in the, in the last century, people uh, would learn uh, a certain trade and then that would be their job for the rest of their lives and they would be defined very much by that job. Uh, and this is slowly changing, but our memory of that time isn't changing seemingly as fast. So this is coloring this discussion, like uh, what, uh, what, what will a drummer do when the uh, when drum machine you know, <laughs> takes his job? And, you know, well, it could go learn another instrument. You know, that's something that the drum machine cannot do. Or he could invent a new instrument, or he could just, you know, make use of that draw machine, which is exactly what happened. Uh, so anyway, that's just a footnote. Yes. There's a revolution on the way, you say. Yes. Um, there are risks and there are opportunities. Yes. Should the government or the society 
prepare for this by by having a plan to minimize the risks and trying to optimize the the, the opportunities so that we as a society will retain or even improve our competitiveness compared to like other nations because at the end of the day we are just like a small company here in Iceland and how do we survive? The decision if we go digital has been made already even if we all in this room would vote that we would, would stick in a state of 1985 everything analog with a record and telephone with a cable yeah it, it wouldn't work right I mean you're right and the question is do you want to be on top of development then you can decide with your ethical uh, background with your cultural background with your data protection background with your sharing background how you want to you want to uh, how this this our, our future life and and, and our, our workplace and our smart home how they should look like and how how, how it in, interacts with our societal goals uh, this is this one thing you can do or you can wait for another five years and have a committee and discuss and see and and wait the, the dangers about and then you can and then you can buy the technology from others around the globe and then it comes with the, with the, with all implications I mean of you know, data security and, 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 and usability usefulness yes society should have a plan and if you look at the successful ones they usually do but Japan's particularly the one that sticks out mm -hmm. they deliberately decided to go into microcontrollers and uh, chips for a whole bunch of reasons but the big one was uh, if they could make them it was very cheap to ship them from Japan to elsewhere and if they'd made something a lot larger well Japan has no natural fuel sources so it was a wrong cost equation small countries especially have a huge advantage here because it's much easier for them to consider what their resources are to have a general discussion with everybody about where they want to go as a society and then to implement the plan I mean it's, you don't want to get trapped into the five-year plan schedule approach, heavily centralized planning that Russia did. But on the other hand, you need to think about what the best way is to basically ride this, you know, very turbulent time that we're going to be going through for the next foreseeable future. Um, some people have even speculated that Elon Musk's kind of doomsday comments are geared towards the government and trying to get them to get more on board with regulations because it takes them so long to do things. So some people think that he has like an end goal to trying to have this point of view. I don't know if that's true, but... It's also not a bad yeah. thing to slow things down, right? You know, better to take a year or two and think about it than to just go herring off in the wrong direction because, you know, by the time you realize you're in the wrong place, it's too late quite often to recover or very difficult. But Japan also has the same demographic problems that Germany has. I don't know about the, the about Iceland, but I mean, or, yeah, age pyramid is like this. So, I mean, and, and Japan has been investing into robots, I mean, helping, taking care of the elderly people, helping them, I mean, uh, living a safe, self-sustainable life for longer, I mean, with good reason. Yeah, but Japan also sees itself as being heavily overpopulated, so they don't see it as a demographic problem. You know, mm -hmm. they see a declining population as a thank heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so again, this gets misinterpreted in the West. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe one thing that makes sense, like we were talking about earlier today. You know, to sorry, when we when for example, industry is is using the machine learning and you know working with data is to design the process, you know, as a safe process from the beginning and, you know, keep this one of the fundamentals of the design. So, I mean, this is maybe something we have to keep in mind. Yeah, we had a large discussion about starting with privacy by design from the industry so that uh, it's in place from the beginning and you don't have to go back and try to fix it. Mm. Don't let foreign powers subvert your elections. It never ends well. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brexit? <laughs> oh my God. There was a, I think there was a Sorry, I think there's a question in the back. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Uh, every time I discuss uh, about AI with just people that are not tech people like us, or, or and when I listen to the questions here, it seems very much that many fears are because there's a, a lack of information on what AI is in, in just the general population. And and I was wondering, um, what can we, what what should we be doing? to displace these fears like do we need to hold some kind of events where we educate people about what AI is, what it means for jobs, what it means for this, what are the benefits. You know, like there needs to be some kind of effort because 
when I hear you answer the questions, it's always the same type of answers, and, and they come from the fact of like when you look at how um, people you know started being scared of machines from the time, or, you know, like the 1800s when like uh, Charles Babbage was making his first calculators and stuff like that. In like uh, I was reading this book called The Innovators, and you see like a lot of these patterns repeating. There's like people are afraid of this technology, but then you know society transforms, jobs get displaced, and and I think that's a, that book's a great example of you know how like when you see how the world became more digital, uh, you know like it, that, that like doom, doomsday day never came. You know like yes, some things with privacy definitely need to be dealt with. That they've like evolved too fast for us, and now we're realizing a little bit later in the game uh, that we have to do something about it. But uh, you know, like the pattern is that if you steer things uh, in a good direction with good regulations, then a lot of good things can come, as you have told us with your example. So, what can we do to educate, you know, the general population? What what do we have to be doing to appease these fears and to steer things in the right direction? And maybe you already said this in the morning, but you know, we were not there when you possibly talked about these things. Yeah. One issue is that mm -hmm. I think we need more thoughtful and accurate media coverage of issues around AI. We see a lot of hype and <coughs> inaccuracies that we really tend to make people afraid uh, more than it should be. I will say that, sorry, before we finish, move on. This was actually a theme at our panel at our last event in Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, and many people felt, first of all, that AI is not the only technology with this problem. There's a lot of data siloing in general within technology uh, and the people that interact with that technology, not just AI. Uh, and the industry really needs to get multilingual and figure out how to communicate better in general, not just with AI. Uh, and many people on the panel actually felt one solution to this was integrating more liberal arts capabilities within technology companies. Also, interesting. I mean, uh, interesting enough that, that um, people people are technology skeptic, and they have the impression that they are behind anyway. I mean, operating their their iPhone and all these computer things, and so. And then I say, yes, of course. Look at the menus of, of, of Excel or something like this. Of course, it's a nightmare. It's horrible. That's not the way we want to interact with machines. How about a machine that has a do what I want button? That is smart. That knows what kind of calculation I want to do. Instead of going through all these menus and formatting issues, and I mean, it, it's not that the magic things that I want from the machine, right? But the, but the interaction is completely unnatural. And if I explain it, this to people, but because they think it will get ever more complex, that's, I mean, because, right, they don't know that the machines will be complex, but the interface might, might be much simpler. I mean, talking to a Alexa or Siri of the future might be a much nicer way of achieving the same thing that, that takes you a workshop of two days today to, for some small formatting changes in, right? But, um, but this, the, there are easy ways of explaining this, but people don't want to listen to these things. I mean, it's more interesting to listen to Elon Musk and, and, and to, a, to a robot woman in Saudi Arabia that got citizenship. Uh, these are the stories that, are, that, that, that raise more uh, attention at this point. So could we have some kind of like annual AI awareness day where we can you know, educate people and, and especially maybe educate people when they are young? And also maybe like at the same time have some kind of like accountability panel where we say like, okay, like, this is what we're doing about all the dangers, so, you know, and, and so we can cover all those bases. So, like, these are the benefits. Yes, there's these political things with the data sharing and the insurance companies, but here's what we're doing. Like, how can we start some kind of effort to, like, educate and both, like, reflect how we're being accountable to society? Well, I'm, I'm missing all the, the intellectuals, the writers, the journalists, the people, I mean, that should help society, I mean, deal with challenges and, and issues, right? And they, many of them are so so skeptic and then they write these Frankenstein stories of the AI, I mean, taking over. You can't, can't totally blame the media. How many AI companies here in the Nordics, or technology companies, not just AI companies, sit in stealth for like two years working on their projects and they come out and nobody knows who they are? Does that really help the communication mm. and what the technology does and how you should interact with it? Also, I mean, I think it comes from both sides. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's true. <laughs> the media is kind of under siege at the moment itself. You know, ever since it became ad funded, it's basically being funded by, you know, the number of clicks or impressions it can get. So they're being operated on by algorithms, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing some of these articles. They're the ones that attract attention. The boring article that, you know, we're going to be working on this for a few years, and you're not going to get it when people are promising. <laughs> you know, nobody's reading that article. Nobody would read that article. Um, the world is going to end tomorrow, but that's, you know, everybody's going to click on that one. Um, would, would be a chance for the planet to recover. Have you tried adding a picture of a dog on top of the article? I believe like cats would. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, uh, an, uh, an, uh, an annual uh, AI awareness day is a really great That's idea. That's nice, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good the, idea. The chair is still... Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, we had a question over here. Uh, uh, what is, in your opinion, the largest immediate way that we can apply AI in education? Uh, actually, the company I work for is kind of uh, focusing on that. We are trying to make a dashboard for teachers where we uh, collect data from all kinds of learning applications and so the teacher will be able to have a classroom full of uh, kids and they will be able to work on different kinds of problems and be on different places. So one is far ahead and another one is like needs more time and is working slower. And the teacher will be able to see where each the student is working, how it's going, and be able to see two minutes after the, the student is stuck on some problem that okay, over here we need help. So uh, this monitoring process will really help. But as well, with uh, as we would gather more data, we would be able to mark some students as being as they might have some problem, for example, dyslexia or some other kind of problem, and we might figure out that in the data we see a trend. So uh, with time, we might be able to help the education system to uh, mark those students a lot sooner, so they will get the help and the opportunity to study in a way that's more efficient for them because for someone that's dyslexic and trying and trying and trying and not achieving anything is really wasteful, I think, for students. So I think there's really, really great, great opportunities, opportunities in education to improve the school, school system in general. There was a recent article in the communications of the ACM uh, about um, tablets having a much stronger hold on the attention of, of young kids than anything else that uh, the psychologists mm -hmm. had ever come across. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to use that magnetism in a way that uh, utilizes the kids' time with these gadgets better. Uh, not that I advocate, uh, you know, I mean it seems like tablets are basically replacing TV as the, the, the technology problem of the youth. Uh, but uh, in any case, if what they're doing is, is more active, is more interaction, then I think it's already an improvement on the TV situation but, uh, of the past. But, but it's, still, uh, it's still something we really have to uh, address uh, seriously. Um, and there are uh, several aspects to this equation that people like Costner, uh, uh, like the, the folks at Costner are just starting to look at uh, uh, and, and elsewhere in the world as well, uh, which involves uh, data, uh, data hosting, control of the data. Uh, will data from, from your six-year-old uh, youth be available 30 years from now? And can someone mine it and when you're running for office and say some nasty things about you because of that or good things? Uh, who knows? But but these are issues we have to think about. Uh, so one is the, the actual just education of the uh, of people in general. It's not just youth. Obviously, we we have come uh, touched on this subject as well, which is the re-education and continuous education, which is increasingly happening. And I hear more more and more of our students that have graduated come back to me and say, "Oh yeah, I just took this online course," uh, you know and in AI, <laughs> um, well, that's my field, so that's why. But uh, there's a lot more material being uh, av come, becoming available and certification methods as, as well. So with distance learning, so so this is basically the the future. Um, so there's that part of education. There's the part about the data and who gets to do what with it. Um, and then there's the the physical, the gadgets, and, and the environments, and, and so on, the technology we use. But how is the situation in Iceland? Oh, can we stick on the, the education? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Okay. okay. <laughs> do we need education if we have AI? Yeah. What do we need? I think, well, my, the simple answer, and, and it, maybe it's not that simple, but uh, in my mind, the f always the first thing that comes to mind when I ask, get asked that question is that we, have, we just have enough complex problems to deal with that the AIs even on the 30-year horizon, are never going to be able to touch them. So if they can free up some time for us to work on those real, significant, important, serious, gloom and doom problems, and these are like global uh, weather <laughs> changes, which, uh, 
that, uh, that really no one has a, a, a solution to. Uh, they're really bigger than any nation. Uh, then that's a good thing, and yes, and then we really do need education for at least 30 years. It needs to smell and be warm to be nice, right? But I mean, we had this language labs at our, our school where we all had headphones and a tape cassette recorder, and then the teacher would sit there 20, we would, we would do like speaking English tests, and the teacher would then switch through and would listen two seconds here, two seconds there. And this was, I mean, heavily inefficient, right, of course, because you could listen to one person at a time, and there were 20 who were training their English. I mean, this is, of course, a great uh, opportunity. But I wonder, I mean, in German high schools, for example, we have no technology in the classroom, and also in the teacher's education, technology, didactics of technology doesn't play any role. So I ask myself, is this better in, in Iceland? Yes. <laughs> but not much. Okay. <laughs> Is there a question back there? Yeah. Okay, I'll take that one. Yes. Um, it would be a motivation, of course. As with any innovation that can potentially bring power and wealth. Uh, so, the argument boils down to this. If this happened so fast, that suddenly someone made themselves king of the planet. And because of the AI they had under their control, no one could do anything about it. Um, then uh, that would be basically be the, the worst kind of nightmare, of 1984 nightmare that you could imagine. But the fact of the matter is, and I haven't seen any good arguments uh, against this point, uh, AI is, or, you know, imagine like a future immensely intelligent machine. Uh, it will need power. It will still run uh, in a digital format, as, as far as we know. It could, could have, maybe it's, you know, quantum computing is some part of it. But this still also requires energy. And the knowledge that this system will need to acquire in order to be super intelligent requires interaction with the world. It's not sufficient to just read what's on the interweb. You, know, it's, uh, you need real interaction with the physical world as well as the mental world. And to understand people, you need to interact with people. And this takes time. This, this is knowledge that takes time to acquire. So the, the prediction that this may happen in a, in a period of a month, and suddenly, at the beginning of the month, you know, November 1st, we have no super intelligent machine. You know, on November 30th, yeah, we got one. It's, it's just ridiculous. Uh, I really don't buy it. I could be wrong. <laughs> but there's an interesting that you read Homo Deus, the, 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 the book by Yuval Harari from the, uh, Harari from the Israeli uh, author. He says, in principle, and it's a very nice book, Homo Deus, I can really recommend it. He says, in principle, the, 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 we are uh, biochemical algorithms, right? I mean, we have, I mean, we have hormones and we have all these kinds of neurons and these things in our body, but in principle, you could, could model uh, us, I mean, and all the things of, that, that people have invented to make us special, like there is a soul or something, I mean, around us, it has never been found by science so far, right? I mean, in basic, basically, we are a, a complex algorithm, and nothing speaks against modeling me so good that the machine would know me as good as I do, and maybe even better, because it's not imperfect, like right? my, my transmission system might be. So. so he says, in principle, yes, but when practically, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's a big issue, and it's a, it's a way to go. And uh, the other day, I saw the, the, the uh, Schmidhuber, I mean, a uh, very known AI professor, and he has been asked this question, what would the super intelligence do to us? But I think it's more like the, like the elephant that doesn't uh, worry about the ant that much. I mean, if there's super intelligence put there, they could travel, I mean, in, 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 in no time to all other galaxies. They wouldn't worry about this, this, small, uh, this small dirty biosphere here, and these few humans, 
I mean, that, that ran down this planet in 150 years. Now uh, they would go somewhere else where it's more exciting. Uh, and so I think the fear, uh, this fear can be destructed by some... Uh, And this is, so uh, just to, to finish my point there, uh, thank you for reminding me. Basically, this is, um, this means that we must have uh, in place processes for uh, ensuring that knowledge gets published. And so the, the general model of universities doing uh, research for the benefit of the, of the general uh, public and for, um, uh, and, and for government, for um, taxpayers' money, essentially, uh, in return, publishing the results of that work so that it can benefit everyone, really, really applies in this case, and it's really important. So if, if I'm wrong that, uh, that this can't happen so quickly, uh, that it, in fact, can happen this quickly, then, well, it's not going to be a month, but uh, quickly enough that it becomes a danger like that, then the, our only resource uh, or recourse to to counter that is to uh, have a, a tradition of open opening the results and giving everyone access, because then there is no disproportionate advantage. Well, I think the larger forced. answer is we, we need to really make sure we have fault tolerant societies, and fault tolerant economies, and fault tolerant financial systems, so that if somebody comes up with a foolproof way of you know, making a profit on the stock market, and the analysis is basically if you can do it for three months, you would end up owning the entire America. Um, you know, we, we have a way to deal with that, because it could happen. I mean, you know, the way things are developing this quickly, it won't matter whether it's in the public domain or not. Things are moving so quickly, and it's possible for a small number of people to do so much so quickly that the rest of us simply won't be able, it'll happen before we can do anything about it, and then we turn around and it's kind of like, okay, we've got to deal with this situation. And that's a much, much harder problem. What would happen if the big four, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, if they would switch off the services right now, for Europe, say, hmm? what would happen, right? <clears throat> An entire generation would have to learn to talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and read these things you call maps? <laughs> <laughs> There are technical ways to stop the abuse occurring, but we would have to agree as a society that we are going to require them. Um, and the ways aren't just forbidding people to do that, because that just doesn't work. The way is to, in some sense, corrupt the data that is being collected so that it's either not useful or simply not possible to use it for those purposes. I mean, the problem is you've got, to, you've got to basically limit at some point on how much data can be processed at one single point. And the social problem is that that limit has gone way above what we used to have. So now it's possible to look at these huge databases and get a lot of information out of them. If you push those databases really, really big again so you can no longer do that, you've recovered some of the privacy that you had just by being part of a large group. Um, there are techniques that could do that, but we'd have to require that they are used. Otherwise, the genie's out of the, the box, and the only other thing is just to accept that all data is public, at some level require all data is public, and then it's a slightly even playing field, but not really when you've got people like Google involved, because they can just require more resources. So this is not a question that has any easy answers, and that we're living through the consequences right now. I mean, one thing that, 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 that goes in the same direction is, that, is when we use machine learning, then, then, then the machines are in a way descriptive in what they see in the data, right? I mean, then people criticize machines that learn that women are connected to adjectives like beautiful and blah, 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 and men are uh, related to adjectives like strong, visionary, and so on and so forth. But that's what the machine read 
on the web where they where they learn, right? And then we had like racist machines and and, and, and that, that have Nazi <laughs> jargon and all these kinds of things because I mean people talk like this to the machines, and uh, 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 these the machines are in the way not not normative. You cannot you cannot uh, at this point you cannot build the, the super ethical the super neutral machine that that has a has a concept of how the world of how we would like our world to have. No, but. Pollute the data, basically. Mm -hmm. Really, yeah, seriously. So do you agree with that? Or, you know, because I think that's a, it's a very important question. Mm -hmm. You could also build AI to detect that this is ongoing and make it public. Mm -hmm. There is manipulation. So, fine. I think we should differentiate between there's technological solutions, but there's also regulatory and policy solutions. Maybe that's two different discussions. Absolutely. Yeah. This is, I'm sorry? This is a technical question. So you're talking, going back to like privacy by design and corrupting the data? And, yeah. yeah. And, and when you start, let's say, putting together you know, certain, uh, certain data that you that can make it aware to make, uh, let's say, all people aware that, that this analysis is ongoing with Microsoft in you know, certain schools of reality. Isn't this a policy or regulatory question rather than a technical question? I mean, to me, when you say making this, people aware... This activity of Cambridge Analytica, to the best of my knowledge, would be illegal in Europe, even even with the current uh, uh, privacy regulation. And it will definitely be illegal with GDPR. And that's great. I urge you to, to go on YouTube and see what Cambridge Analytica is doing. If you haven't done it, it's, yeah, it's scary. <coughs> <coughs> and that's great, but you know, and that protects us from companies that are operating within Europe. It doesn't protect us from companies that operate outside Europe. It doesn't protect us from states, right? That's the real problem. You know, it's it's the Russia's of this world, China, and potentially America. Uh, when the states get into it, you know, all rules are basically out of the, uh, the floor. And it, it, we, we, I mean, it's, this isn't going to have a silver bullet solution. We're going to have to tackle it at all levels, and. We're going to have to think very carefully about what sort of society we want to live in. Um, we can, you know, we could try to forbid it, and certainly technically we could make it probably difficult if not impossible to do. And that will have a cost somewhere else. There'll be things that we would like to do and we can't. And we're going to have to decide collectively or individually. You know, some countries will decide they want to be Europe, they want to be safe from this, and other countries won't. And will then run the experiment on this planet about which countries prosper. Um, I'm not putting my money on the countries that go, you know, into the George Orwell, all data is available to be Cambridge analytic. Um, I wouldn't expect that to succeed, but I'm sure there will be countries that will find it and basically try it and find out what the hell it leads to. But it's also an individual responsibility to, I mean, we're feeding the monster every day, we're pushing yes. data to feed them. Facebook to Google to all these companies and we have to think about what we are and what yeah. we can also corrupt the data. I mean I could become very interested in beauty and small kittens just to you know screw up the system. Yes. Uh, there are some Chrome plugins I can direct you to yes. if that's what we have to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're almost at the end here. We had a question here. Yeah, this is just on the same uh, subject. Uh, you know, notwithstanding the sensationalistic journalism and uh, you know the possibility of general AI. Um, it doesn't matter what we as a nation or what Europe wants to do, we cannot control the other nations. So do you worry that we are already in an arms race in terms of just weaponizing AI? The Cold War of data and algorithms? Probably. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 I mean, Probably. America got attacked, Britain got attacked. China. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know. Uh, I mean, Britain, uh, you know, I think it was three years now, they basically stated <coughs> that the army was hiring 4,000 people to essentially uh, play around on, facial, uh, on social media. Uh, so we know, you know, how many people the British have on it. Um, 
it's been obvious on a lot of the newspapers, the comments field, that there are Russian and Chinese commentators um, trying to interfere with what's being said, and I'm sure there are also British and American ones. Uh, they're probably not quite as detectable. So it, it's happening, it's ongoing. Um, and the problem for small countries uh, like us is, you know, we're a very easy target for somebody, you know, for a superpower. If we're lucky, they'll just ignore us because we're too small to be bothered with. Um, but, you know, we can't ignore these things. Uh, they're going to happen whether we like it or not. Yeah, well, the last one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I just find it interesting that uh, we're an open panel like this one. All the questions become uh, ethical questions, essentially, um, uh, and, and about the potential, the usually negative potentials of AI. Uh, so, I, so my question is: So, uh, what are we doing? We're in a university. You know, what are we doing to to uh, maybe address these ethical questions, concerns? You mentioned uh, Homo Deus, a, a very good book about you know, on the based on history and how. He takes you know, note of this technology and, and how it actually makes a very good case of how this will uh, develop. And, and you know, are, we, are we addressing this with, uh, with students uh, you know, in, in computer science? And are we taking this seriously as yes, all these ethical questions and, and questions that you've got regulations and so on and so forth? Well, I, I think um, there is an, there certainly a need um, in, uh, in computer science to include more uh, social education and legal education. I mean, it might be uh, sufficient uh, to begin with uh, as, as little as, as, one, as one course on each, uh, but at some point, you know, you fill, the, you fill all the requirements and there's no uh, electives anymore and people won't come. So there's, uh, but, but yeah, I think there's, uh, and I think this is a reflection, actually, of a, a general problem that you have in universities that they, they, always, they are always looking in the uh, rear view mirror. They're thinking about what has happened so far, how should we be structured? Instead of turning on the headlights and saying, what will the future be like? How should we be structured so that we can deal with that? So that is sort of fairly high level. A few technical and societal questions are, are, are mixing that much and, and, and the disconnect between our, so to speak, everyday work, like, like we are building a, like a, a text analytics uh, plat, uh, pipeline for a customer to analyze Google, uh, uh, to analyze Amazon reviews. I mean, and this is what, what our people are doing every day and it's hard work and there are many, many technical problems. I mean, to the question of, of so to speak, ruling the world by, by, by data analytics, right? That the disconnect is so huge that I that I think, as you said, I mean, being aware and doing small steps here or there, but I mean, there is so much like 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 reading the ball in in, in all these things that are, that it's difficult to motivate people to uh, and to and to find uh, co convincing answers. I think this has to do. We also need to talk to to writers, to poets, and to 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 artists. I mean, I think uh, this the, the whole society needs to needs to learn and, and discuss, and not only <coughs> the technicians. Maybe they are not the best people to, uh, to talk about uh, societal things, yeah, right? So, yeah. You also ask, what are we doing? Um, and I can say that for some of the universities that we work with, with Nordic AI, they've been trying to uh, be more focused and dedicated towards interdisciplinary studies uh, as their coming plan for education. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely part of the solution, uh, which goes back to your question of including more liberal arts uh, and these mm -hmm. discussions around STEM in general. And I think, you know, we do need to sort of move over to, you know, a defense against the dark arts approach. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, we, we've sort of, you know, centralization happens apart from anything else because it's very easy. And as people are saying, the, the defense against it is a much harder problem. But we need to start putting resources into that. And also, as technologists, talking to our colleagues in the liberal arts, you know, we don't, unless you're interested in it separately, we don't study human social history in engineering to understand necessarily just what can be done with the toys that we come up with. Um, but it's a pretty horrifying history if you look across the, uh, our species. And, you know, it needs that kind of interaction to make people who are, you know, we're, all, we're very guilty in technology of being obsessed with our toys and obsessed with the power of it and not thinking about the consequences. You know, and it's Pandora's box all over again. You know, it's, uh, these old themes in human history just keep coming back to haunt us. 
So um, I think we should uh, stop here. I mean, this is a discussion that needs to continue. But Helke Pat, uh, Activity Stream, uh, Red uh, Kostner, uh, Josha, uh, DFKI, Lisa Malner, Nordic AI, uh, there's a lot of AI. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jos Kirtner at Knox Medical and Jackie Mallet at Triple M. Thank you very much and thank everyone here. I would also like to thank our sponsors, Reykjavik University, Triple M, Kadia, the RUAI Lab, Nordic AI, and City of Reykjavik. Thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure to have you here.